Good morning. This morning's scripture reading will be from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 18 through 27, and I'll be reading from the New International Version. But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all in one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I do not need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honorable we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined them, the members of the body, and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Good morning. Get kind of tickled at Logan. I gave him that scripture reading this morning. He said, you won't have time to preach by the time I read all those verses. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to get a scripture reading that's just a verse or two long, but Logan does a good job, and I appreciate Logan. And I told him, I said, well, I'll get somebody else to do that if you want. He said, oh, no, I got this. I got this. But uh, I appreciate our young men. I appreciate their desire to want to grow and to do more as far as our worship service goes. I commend you for your singing this morning. Uh, and the vote was in, women, you sound better than us, men. Uh, but our song service is very beautiful, and I love the simplicity of our worship. I love the way God designed for us in his mind uh, for something simple for us is what he desires for us to worship him. And why people want to continually add things to that to mess it up, I'll never know. Uh, but I am thankful for the simplicity of singing in our worship as God commanded us to do. Uh, and you sound beautiful in doing that as well. You're to be commended as a congregation. Andy mentioned it just a few moments ago, but the things that you did this week, uh, whether you paid attention to those announcements as we're going through the PowerPoint there, uh, but we were responsible as a congregation, and I appreciate Andre and Jamie's efforts in putting this together, and, and also Roxanne and the school that she works where we were supplying coats to 20 kids, uh, kids that were in immediate need uh, of a warm coat to wear for the winter, and I commend you for that as well. And keep that up, and keep up the good work in doing that as well. Nobody likes to not feel like they're needed. I don't care what you're talking about. I don't care what aspect that you're dealing with in your life. Everybody likes to feel important. Everybody likes to feel needed. I can tell you a story. When I first started working at Fort Hill, in my association with them, they had a work day. And they called all those that they thought would come and bring people to help to come to camp on a particular Saturday. And they had a bunch of tasks that needed to be done, and they wanted people who were specialties in this field and that field or whatever it may be so I took a group of people from the Ironton congregation to Fort Hill one Saturday morning and there we were going to work and do whatever needed to be done there were about 20 of us and we got there and we were 20 of about 100 that had showed up that day which is unheard of for a Fort Hill work day sort of like a work day at the congregation on Saturday morning when you've got uh, 150 folks that could be there and there's five so they were overwhelmed with the number of folks that were there there was a gentleman at Fort Hill at that particular time his name was Ivan Triplett anybody know Ivan or knew Ivan Ivan has since passed from this world Ivan was one of the most hard one of the hardest working individuals that I'd ever met in my life Ivan was very active on the board and Ivan was one of those individuals that he always felt like if there was something that needed to be done just go ahead and do it he didn't believe in asking people for help. So we get there, and we're all standing around, and we're waiting on to figure out what we needed to do. Well, Ivan had already lined it all out, and all of a sudden, everybody took off, and they were doing all of their tasks, and there stood a group of about 45 of us. We didn't know what to do. We didn't know where to go. We didn't know where help was needed. And as human nature would be, I know you should, you're going to say, well, you should have just jumped in and did something anyway. Human nature is, if you don't feel like you're needed, you feel useless, why am I here in the first place? 
So 45 people that day turned around, walked, got back in their cars and left. Because they didn't feel like they were needed. Nobody likes to feel not needed. And the church, it is no different. We see the verse here that, that Logan had read for us this morning. You're familiar with this passage there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Here the subject is being addressed of the idea of the body being the church and those members of the church talking about us who make up the body of Christ, how important each and every one of those individual things, parts are in relationship to the work getting done at church. And again, everybody wants to know and to feel they're a part, but sometimes we're guilty of just doing it ourselves. We can stand up here, the elders, the person doing the announcements, me, and say, well, we need some of you to do this. And I know in my mind that when I say that, there are many of you who are just going to go do it yourself. But what about those who don't? Do you have to do a great work in the church to feel like you're a part of the church? This morning I've entitled the lesson, Everybody Matters. And everybody does matter in life. Everybody matters in the church and everybody matters in your family. But locally here in this congregation, we need to realize everybody's important. It's going along the idea of God's law of service. And in that law of service is the idea that every Christian has a work to do and every Christian is to use their gift or their talent in the church if you turn to matthew chapter 25 there in beginning in verse 14 i'm not going to read it but there is your reference of the story of the talents the parable of the talents where five were given two were given and one was given and the one that had five he took it and he put it to work and he came and he get when the master came back he had doubled that and the one with two talents in like manner did the same thing he doubled the talents he made use of the gift and he prospered and then there was the one talent man who took his one talent, knowing that his master was shrewd in, in his dealings with money and his dealings with people. And he took that one talent and he took it and he buried it in the ground. Sound familiar? Taking something that is, can be useful and burying it in the ground. And when the master came, he brought him back his one talent and he was rebuked. He was told, you're better off than if you would have taken this and put it in the bank, and at least I would have drawn some interest from this talent. Now, very specifically in this example, it's talking about money, but it's going far beyond that and talking about our individual talents or gifts that God has given us. Are you using them? Everybody can do something, but oftentimes, who gets the most attention? And here's just a list of a few. The deacons, the elders, the teachers, preachers, lead leaders of various tasks. It seems that a lot of times a lot of focus is given towards a particular office or a particular work and we pinpoint somebody. But I believe it goes beyond that. And I believe for the church to function, there are a whole lot of small parts that have to come together. You know, it's like a car. If you work on a car at all, you will find out that diagnosing a new car today, a car that was built in the last 10 or 15 years, trying to pinpoint a problem on a car is difficult to do without a computer nowadays because there are so many working parts to make that thing run, and if you mess one of those parts up, <clears throat> you got a problem. And you got to start one by one pinpointing which bad part is to get it all working in unison again the church is the same way it all comes together it all works together but beyond these think about this with me what about the mothers who train their children and oversee their household are they an important part of the church do they matter today you moms who got up this morning and you wrestled with those kids not saying dads didn't help there either and those of you who your kids are gone away and on their own and those that are in college, you, you can remember back. You remember those days? I remember very Renee coming in when they were small, all three of them, two, they're two years apart, 
and, and when they were like six, four, and two, and I can remember, I would always get up early and go to church, and I was refreshed and ready to go. And I can remember Renee walking in, tugging all three kids, and her hair all out of place, and, and whew, she had a war, but she did it. What about those moms who have diligently over the years trained their children in the ways of the Lord? What about fathers who support their families and live godly lives in an unrighteous world? Are they an important part of what's going on in the church? Oh, yes, very much so. The sick or the elderly who offer up prayers on behalf of others. The humble servant who offers a cup of water in Jesus' name to someone who is in need. The humble, the humble servant whose life sets an example for other people. See, here when Jesus talked in, in 1 Corinthians, when Paul was writing here about the body, he's trying to get them to understand and to accept each other and to realize that everybody's special gift and special talent has to be there. And you can't bury it in a hole and not use it. And I'm telling you this morning that as a part of the Centerville Church of Christ, you have a gift and you have a talent. It might not be preaching. It might not be leadership as far as elder or deacon. It might not be Bible class teacher. But every one of you sitting here today listening to my voice, you have a talent. And you have an ability to do something for the good of the cause of Jesus Christ. Somewhere, someplace, sometime in your life and in the world in which you live, there is some gift that God has given you that you need to use for the glory of God Almighty. You see, that's what it's all about. Everything we do and everything about who we are as individuals needs to be for that very reason. Is that the cause of Christ, glorifying His name, lifting Him up in our lives so that people can see that. It's been said that most people will never live exceptional lives according to world standards. Anybody here ever made the news? I'm sure many of you have. Anybody here been brought to the White House and to be honored by the leaders of our country for some exceptional service that you've performed? And many who've served, given their life in the military service, maybe that's you. For even serving in the military, to me, you've lived an exceptional life. For giving your life and part of your life for the service of this country, you deserve to be in that category of exceptional lives because I think you have. But what about those that haven't? It's been said people like to read their name in the newspaper. Well, it depends on what it's there for, <laughs> I suppose. But people like to read their name to be honored but most of us that'll never happen but you think about Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6 John writes that we are kings and priests unto God you see everybody matters let me give you some examples Bible examples of how important you are God used one man to save an entire human race. That one man was who? Noah. Noah living in a world of wickedness. Noah, what can I do? What possibly can I do? Noah, you're going to build an ark. You're going to build a big boat. And on that boat, you're going to take a certain amount of animals, and you're going to take all the righteous of the world. And the only righteous of the world at that time was Noah, his wives, his three sons, and their wives. That was a whole lot, wasn't it? But through one man being obedient to what God had commanded him to do and to use the talents that God had given him, he was able to save the entire human race. <clears throat> God used one man to deliver his people, Moses. We're studying Moses on Sunday night in our Bible curriculum, uh, in all of our classes. And to think of the important things that Moses did. And here Moses was trying to make every kind of excuse that he could come up with of why he wasn't going to be the one. And you think about Moses growing up, and we talked last Sunday night in our class, in the adult class with Mark teaching, you know, why me, Moses kept asking. Why me? Why do you want me? Why was it Moses? Because that's who God chose, because Moses had an exceptional ability to bring people together. 
We don't see it there. We don't really see it when he goes before Pharaoh, but we see it when he gets those people out and they're wandering in the wilderness. You take two or three million people and lead them on that journey, you better be an exceptional organizer and leader of the people to get that done. And God knew that. And I think sometimes we don't necessarily know what our talent is, but it's in there and God knows what it's there for and you got to find what it is. God used one man to rally Israel against the Philistines, David, little boy David. What could he do? I love that story. I love the point of the story where David steps forward and they put all the armor on him and he begins to fall over because it's so heavy. He's so little, he can't carry it. He says, take this off of me. I don't want this. Just give me my slingshot and let me get my rocks. And he steps out and I love the the Bible and, and it's, sincerity where it shows that Goliath looked at him and kind of chuckled kind of laughed you're gonna bring this boy here you see David had a talent it wasn't a being that he could throw a rock he had a talent in that he knew that God was on his side and I think a lot of times the encouragement that we might need is to think well somebody believes in me And I believe as a parent in raising kids that you need to give in your kids and instill in them that you as a parent, if nobody else in the world does, but you as a parent, you believe in your kids. When I was growing up, my dad, one of the things that he always, and my dad was, I won't tell you about my dad, my dad didn't like certain things and the one thing one of the things that would set my dad off the most is if somebody were to look at me or my sister and say you're stupid and I can remember one time I looked at my sister and I told her you're stupid I'll never I never made that mistake again my dad grew up in an environment where you were nothing. You were going to be nothing, you were going to be nobody, you were useless, you weren't going to turn out to be anything. And he said in his mind that he was not going to raise kids to where they didn't have a sense that they were something and they were important and they could succeed at anything that they wanted to do. People need to feel like they can succeed. And it works in the church as well. I don't believe as a preacher that my role is to stand up here Sunday after Sunday and beat people on the head and say, here's what you're not doing. And I don't think I've done that. I think we need to be encouraged to know this is what we can do, this is what we should do, and you have the ability to do it. Now, there comes a time to where there may be a need to a little bit extra push. There may be a time, I believe biblically, that in, in teaching we need to let people know that there are some things that maybe we're not doing that we should be doing. And that's not compromising truth. That's not compromising salvation. But I believe we need to be encouraged along the way, just like we encourage our kids. My kids haven't always been perfect. You know, I, my kids have been perfect old, they're, you know, they're 20, I don't even know how old they are. <clears throat> 23, 21, and 19. Two of them soon, soon to be those ages. And of all those years, Kayla being the oldest, 23, she's been perfect in those 23 years. I'm a realist, 23 of those years. Right? Not hardly. Not hardly. Kayla came into this world screaming, and she's been screaming ever since. And I don't have time to go into Tyler and Hope. But they've always been encouraged to do their very best, that God loves them, and they'll never be able to do anything to separate themselves from the love that God has for them. They may make mistakes, but God still loves them. I make mistakes as a parent, but God still loves me. You as individual Christians, you may not be perfect. You may not always do the right thing, but I can tell you today, there's one person that loves you more than you'll ever know until you stand before him on that great day, and that is our Heavenly Father. God loves you regardless. Regardless. 
Does he demand, does he command obedience from us? Yes. But he knows we're not going to always be what we're supposed to be. And he loves us. Through one, we see this connection. Elijah, the one man to overcome spiritual corruption in Israel. And we see that Esther, that God used one woman to save the Jews from a deadly plot. And look at the role that Esther played in bringing about what God would have bring about. A little child. Matthew chapter 18. We set that little child in front of them and said, Except you be as one of these, you're never going to understand. A small boy in his lunch. John chapter 6 and verse 9. A friend in his tomb. In John chapter 11 with the death of Lazarus. And there's so many more. I want you to consider this. If you've ever wondered if you are important to God's work, remember the last verse that Logan read for you this morning. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. I don't read a lot of poetry. I don't read a lot of quotes from people. There's one quote that I read several years ago that I absolutely love. And it's a quote from a lady you're all going to know when I say her name, and her name is Helen Keller. Helen Keller borrowed this quote from a man named Hale several years, centuries before her. But she's the one that kind of made it famous. And Helen Keller was famous for, for a lot of things. And she made a lot of quotes, but I think this is the best one. I am only one, but still I am one. <clears throat> I cannot do everything, but still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do something that I can do. Fits, doesn't it? Fits. The body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. They're all important. Whether you're an arm or a finger, a knee, an ankle, a foot, you're all important. You all matter. Without you, the church would not be. Without your daily dedication to the work of the Centerville congregation, we wouldn't be. Without your love of God, without your commitment to Jesus Christ, where would we be? So let me say this. Whether you preached a sermon, whether you taught a Bible class, whether you sent a card, whether you picked up the phone and made just one phone call to encourage somebody, whether you brought in food to give out in our food basket, whether you gave money or you bought a coat to give in our coat drive, whether you spoke a kind word to a visitor that was in our midst, you are part of the body. That work, that talent is important to the work of the Centerville Church of Christ. We talk about being a light in this community. You know how we become a light in this community? It's not by putting the weight of everything on the shoulders of our elders. It's not by putting the, the, all the weight of that on my back. We become a light in this community by each and every one of us individually continuing to use our gift and to use our talent for the glory of God in Jesus Christ in this community. That's how we get that accomplished. And that's what we've got to continue to do. It's good to look around this morning and to see a practically full building, isn't it? Are we satisfied with where we are or do we want to push on? I want to push on. Do you want to push on? I want to go beyond. See, I want to out this building. Can I just say that? Not because I don't like it. I like the quaintness of it. I like the fact that if you get here late, you're getting pushed farther and farther to the front. Let me tell you what, the, the most comfortable seats in this building are the first three rows. Because they haven't been worn out. But I want to grow. Not so I can stand up here and say we've got 300 members, but because that says we've been a light in this community. And we've taken the gospel to the lost and dying world.
If you're here this morning and you've never obeyed the gospel, that's the most important thing. Is that you use your talent of understanding, your, your talent that God has given you of wisdom to be under, under, able to understand Scripture. That if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you can have salvation today. We'll baptize you for the remission of your sins. Or if you need the prayers of this church, we're going to sing this song uh, to encourage you. And as we bring this lesson to a close, let me say this. Thanksgiving is Thursday. And on behalf of Renee and myself and Kayla and Tyler and Hope, we want you to know that we love each and every one of you dearly. And that we thank you for what you've done in our life. Thank you for the encouragement that you've given us since we've been here. It's almost two years. Do you realize that? Time flies when you're having fun. If anybody says it feels like 20, I'll put you under a bush out there and shake all the things on you. But for my family, two years, I pray that you have a blessed Thanksgiving with your friends and your family. And I pray that if there's one here this morning that needs to respond to this invitation, that you'll do so while you have the opportunity as we stand and sing. Right.